Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and today I'm resuming with my April catch-up wrap-up with my next batch of five books. This batch contains my favorite read of April, my least favorite read, and a couple exactly in the middle, so it's truly a mixed bag. The first one is The Red Threads of Fortune by J.Y. Yang, which I'm going to call the second in the series. Technically the two novellas currently out are companion novellas and they can be read in any order. I think you should read The Black Tides of Heaven first and then The Red Threads of Fortune because that is the internal chronological order and it makes a lot of sense for the story arc, but you do you, whatever you want to do. The Red Threads of Fortune focuses on Makoya, one of the twins whose early life is described in The Black Tides of Heaven. She once had prophetic visions that always came true, but after the tragedy that ends the other novella, she no longer has her visions and she is um, still very physically scarred from her injuries and she is mentally and emotionally um, scarred as well. She hasn't moved on from the death of her daughter, and now, a couple of years later, she is um, estranged from her husband. But Makoya is now openly supporting the Machinist Rebellion against her mother, the Protector, and here she is working with some other people to track down a deadly Naga, like um, a, a dragon in many senses, I suppose, um, who is threatening a rebellious city near them. I have to say that I didn't enjoy this novella nearly as much as Black Tides, and I will say that I struggled with Makoya in this one. There's a lot more action, which is what made me think I would like it more. Black Tides was very descriptive, very much about describing the world and setting the stage and everything, and I enjoyed that so much because there's some really fascinating aspects of the world building. But here, all of the actions are McCoy's, and I understand why she is the way she is. I wish that I'd been more patient and had more compassion, but she's broken. She's very broken and still lashing out at people. I felt like she was kind of emotionally unstable and not always doing the best things for herself, for taking care of herself and those that she does care for around her. It, it made me not enjoy the story very much. However, um, there is growth <laughs> um, by the end of the novella and I think I would enjoy reading more about Makoya later. I do think that there are going to be at least two more novellas in the series. The next one is coming out around August, and I'm hoping that one of these next ones will focus on Akiha now that Makoya has had um, kind of her novella. I am very curious about Akiha and, and kind of where he was going in, in Black Tides as well. So not as good as the other one, but still glad that I read it. Next, I read A Slip of the Keyboard by Terry Pratchett, which is his volume of collected nonfiction, and it contains a lot of things across his entire career. Um, so it's snippets from newspapers, um, talks that he gave, um, introductions to books, and things like that. I will say that I've always loved Terry Pratchett's novels, I love the Discworld novels, and I love how he incorporated commentary on real things in the Discworld books. And so it surprised me somewhat that in his nonfiction, up until the very end bit, he doesn't really give his opinions on some of these things. I thought there would be more critique, more criticism, more opinions, but on the whole it is Terry Pratchett really enjoyed the writer's life and he has funny things to say about that and going to conventions and meeting fans and stuff like that. Also he worked at like a nuclear power plant early on in his career and I did not know that. <laughs> it was really interesting. Um, so I felt like I got to know a bit more about Terry Pratchett, the man, which I had I just never known before. But then we get to the final section, which is very appropriately called Days of Rage, and those are his last pieces on um, his struggle with early onset Alzheimer's, um, how he became active in Alzheimer's research, um, and fighting for the right to die with dignity and, and euthanasia, basically. Those are the best pieces in here. It's probably the, the only time when Pratchett really comes out and has opinions, that he has a cause to champion, he, he has something to say, and he's very angry about it. And that, that was the best, the best bit. It's incredibly sad as well, but when his 
anger comes comes through that yeah yeah <laughs> everything else is kind of fluffy and fun and then you get to the more hard-hitting stuff so on the whole it was quite enjoyable and I read it very quickly and I really enjoy Pratchett's voice but it it did not do what I think I've come to expect a lot of nonfiction collections like this to do I'm really used to reading Le Guin and she's always saying very insightful things about writing and genre and poetry and politics and everything and Pratchett does not do that same type of thing in this but it's still good and if you want to know a bit more about Pratchett as a person and his involvement in the community in days past, this this would be a good thing to read for that. Unsurprisingly, the next thing that I have to talk about is Ursula K. Le Guin, Conversations on Writing with David Naiman. This is a kind of a cleaned up transcript of three interviews that Le Guin had with David Naiman. I think it was recorded for radio broadcast in, in the Portland area. I'm not entirely sure about that. But um, the three interviews focus on fiction, poetry, and nonfiction. And let me just tell you, I loved this so much. This is one of the few, the few collections, the few books that I've ever read where I feel like it is absolutely perfect for longtime fans as well as complete newbies. It perfectly serves both of those audiences because the interviews are essentially hitting the highlights of, of Le Guin's career, um, Naaman asks really well-researched, very intelligent questions about her books. They dive deep into poetry. Um, he asks her follow-up questions about um, her nonfiction, her, her opinions on genre, and just things that she's said. So for a reader like me, where I've read a ton of her, her criticism, her nonfiction, and a lot of her books, this just brought up all of the best things and a little, it brought further a little more commentary on them. It was a great review, especially at the end of her career. But I could also see this working as an excellent introduction to Le Guin's voice and, and her commentary for a completely new reader. You can read this, figure out the things that you most want to learn more about, and then go find the collection where she has more essays on it, basically. And in that same vein, if you're a new reader, you don't have to feel like you're lost about what they're talking about because they do get very specific about about passages and works and quotations and stuff. And it would be easy to lose interest in that because you haven't read the thing maybe that they're talking about. But there are all of these black pages in this which are... Uh, quotations. They're full reprints of like the poetry piece that they're talking about or an excerpt from a novel to show you the the style and the rhythm of language that they're discussing. And it was great. I'm not sure if I've ever read something like this that has so many quotations and excerpts and stuff in it to give you that context. I really enjoyed it. Like I'd already read some of this stuff but it was so handy to have the words right there to reference and to know what Naaman and Le Guin are talking about. So the contents are excellent. Um, it's not hugely, hugely detailed, but the interview format is, is really great. It's a real conversation. And the physical book itself is just so beautiful. It's a naked hardcover. It's kind of square and very compact feeling and it's, it's just laid out really well on the page. So. I am full of superlatives for this book. <laughs> then I read The Tea Master and the Detective by Aliette de Bodard, which is a novella in her Shuya universe. She's written many short stories, novelettes, and novellas in this universe, and they are my favorite things I've ever read by de Bodard. So this is a standalone novella, and it is very Holmesy, and you can definitely see the Sherlock Holmes influences in the characters and in the plot. So in this universe, there are mind ships. They are ships, but they have a human mind. And in fact, their, their core, their heart, is actually birthed by a human being. So they are, they're people, and they're treated like people. And in fact, they have families and ancestors and descendants and, and all of that, which I've always found to be one of the really cool world building bits in this universe. So the main character of this novella is a mind ship called uh, The Shadow's Child, which has been very traumatized after war. It was left stranded in the deep spaces um, where time and space get weird with all of its crew uh, dead. And so it doesn't want to go back into deep spaces. It is now making a living or <laughs> eking out a living um, by 
brewing tea for space travelers, different blends of tea that help people withstand the effects of space travel and the deep spaces better. And then a new client appears who wants the shadow's child to brew her tea so she can go into deep spaces and find a corpse to analyze um, how deep spaces affect a corpse breaking down. <laughs> um, despite its reservations, uh, the shadow's child is curious and offers to take Long Chow into the deep spaces to find a body. They do. And then Long Chao notices that the body is too fresh, too new, and believes that she has found a murder victim, and she is compelled to discover who this person was, and how she died, and if she was murdered. The Shadow's Child, of course, as you know, the Watson character, is reluctant, but does get pulled along into the mystery as well. And Long Chow is very much the Sherlock Holmes character, especially with her personality. She's very dry and abrasive and says things that seem very, um, seem to really lack compassion for people, but also she clearly cares very much about justice and finding out what happened to this this victim that they found. Um, so I really enjoyed the character types and their interactions. The one thing that held me back from giving this a stellar rating is that I don't think that the plot was strong enough, it wasn't taut enough, it was too vague in places, and it was easy to lose track of what was actually driving people and what they were really going to do next it could have been a bit more concrete. On the other hand, in the Shoyo universe, a lot of the stories really revolve around this careful dance of etiquette and tradition and the things that you can and can't do with people of various social statuses and all of that, that carefully um, choreographed dance in society um, does make things a little bit vague, a little bit um, at a distance sometimes, and that may be some of the effect that made the plot not as as concrete for me. But on the whole, really enjoyed it, and I really love this physical edition from Subterranean Press. I read it without the cover on it, so I was feeling, you know, the cloth-bound hardcover the whole time. I'm like, I just, I love the feel of this book. I keep saying that, but I really, really do. It's shiny and metallic and very pretty. <laughs> The last book in this batch is my least favorite book that I read in April, unfortunately. It is Cities in Flight by James Blish, which is technically a bind-up of four novels that were published in the 1950s and 60s. I think this first omnibus was published in 1970, which is what the uh, copyright date in the SF Masterworks edition says. Um, I was really eager to read this when I first hauled it because the description on the back sounded great. There are these two major inventions that uh, just change humanity entirely, um, anti-gravity devices and anti-aging drugs. So with the anti-gravity devices, they can uplift entire cities and turn them into interstellar spaceships, which is the coolest idea ever. And with anti-aging drugs, most of the population lives kind of forever, and they can withstand these very long journeys in between um, stars and galaxies and stuff. In reality, this is very dated science fiction, um, mostly that comes down to the language. I really struggled with the language in this for some reason. There were just a lot of idioms and phrasings that were so old I didn't actually know what they meant anymore. And that made it difficult for me to connect to the writing, to what was being described, and especially to what people were saying and thus their personalities, I guess. Um, but I also, I was not keen on how the stories actually played out. All of these Flying spaceship cities uh, behave like migrant workers going from one planet to the next, bidding on the next job. They act like hobos and tramps, and this is intentional. I believe this is an intentional riff on hobo culture of the 1950s and migrant workers. My first problem was that I didn't understand how economically this would work because it seemed like every city with thousands or millions of inhabitants only had one job. Every city had one specialty, and it usually came down to manual labor. And that is just so dated. I couldn't imagine, you know, a huge population of people living in a city, living for hundreds of years, and only wanting to do one thing with their lives forever. Humans get bored so easily. It just... 
and the fact that there are so many stories in science fiction and fantasy that deal with the consequences of immortality and how that's actually not a great choice many of the times, this, this scenario completely ignored most of the awful drawbacks of living forever. Um, one of the, the most interesting things about reading this book, however, is that I was finishing it up at the same time that I was reading Terry Pratchett's Collected Nonfiction, and you may notice that on the front of this SF Masterworks edition is a quote from Terry Pratchett that says, this is the real heady wine of science fiction. And yes, he mentions it two or three times in his pieces in this collection. Uh, apparently he read the books when they were coming out in the 50s and 60s when he was, I don't know, like 10, 11, 12 years old, and he devoured them. And it was really making me think about how when these books came out during like golden age of science fiction, this was the thing. This was like crack for young readers. And I could see the parts of it that would probably really appeal to 12 year old boys. It's stories about boys becoming men and manly men chomping on cigars while making tough decisions for their cities and stuff. So it's really manly adventures in the stars and I think that while I found the plots very dated and the hobo culture stuff uh, a little unsavory, that was a perfect mix to create an adventure story back when it was written. So ultimately, I wasn't a fan. I think I gave the entire thing two stars, maybe. Um, I would not recommend it because it's so dated, it's so old fashioned. I don't think this is a good one for newer readers of science fiction to get into, especially if you are like me and you want some more diverse elements, like just more women represented well on the page. It will probably rub you the wrong way. However, if you're really into um, very old science fiction and you really enjoy reading that, I won't dissuade you from trying it out because it certainly has gotten a lot of praise and it has its own place in kind of the canon of the field and all. So I'm kind of glad that I, I worked my way through it, but I wish that I loved it more. I think I have three more books in my or on my physical TBR to read by Blish and I'm hoping that they're just different types of stories and that I get along with them well. Because if nothing else, I do think he was a good writer for the time. I think that his use of language was quite good. And that is it for this batch of books. Do let me know if you've read any of them or if you want to in the comments down below. And I will be back very soon with the next five. And until then, bye.